Hello, and welcome to the 64th Radical Poetry Reading. I'm Malva Kajali, Special Projects Associate here at The Rail, and today I have the pleasure of welcoming esteemed poet Robert Kelly, who has lovingly curated a beautiful lineup of poets and readers for us today, featuring Jerome Rothenberg, Pierre Joris, Kimberly Lyons, and Billy Chernikoff. A few quick notes before we get started. Firstly, we've started all of our events here with two important acknowledgements. The first is that here in New York, we're on the Napahoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsi, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. Uh, the second acknowledgement, which is part and parcel of the first, is the continued recognition that Black lives matter. Secondly, over the past 21 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication, art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a very small nonprofit, we do need your support. So this December, we're fundraising $150,000 in 31 days. We're uh, well on our way. And your contributions will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, poets, and operations uh, at the rail for the coming year. Please check the chat where I'll drop more info and links. But now it's my honor to welcome a wonderful curator, American poet Robert Kelly was born right here in Brooklyn. He attended CUNY and Columbia University and has taught at Bard since 61. He's authored more than 60 published volumes of fiction, poetry, and prose poems. Um, he has served as a poet in residence at many notable universities, including Caltech, Yale, the University of Kansas, Dickinson College, and the University of Southern California. His fiction has been translated variously into Italian, German, and French. Uh, and most recently, he was the 2016-2017 Poet Laureate of Je Dutchess County, New York. Get away, Mr. Kelly. Passing the mic to you. Hello. I have to explain to myself why this is radical poetry. And I think the explanation to which I come is that, well, poetry is radical. Poetry is of the root. What is the root? The root is the word. And what is the root of the word? The root of the word, I think, is what we have today to deal with. The root of the word is our yearning to speak to the other, our yearning for the other. And in that yearning, I think poetry takes its rise. Let me introduce, first of all, Jerome Rothenberg. Over 70 years, Rothenberg has been giving us poetry, his own poetry, lucid, precise, attentive to place and person, insistent, resistant to any kind of verbal tricks. But he has this quiet roar of tradition behind him. And he's given us poetry of much of the world. He gave us our first start with Paul Salon and many other German poets and other poets and Yiddish poets and Native American Indian texts. He gathered together, working with Joris to this extraordinary series of anthologies from the University of California, which are, I think, the greatest anthology of modernism ever, modern poetry ever gathered, an essential text. He also gave me, through his Hawksworth Press, my first raft for me to float on the sea of poetry. We owe him, I owe him, immense gratitude. Please welcome Jerome. Thank you, Robert, thank you. I'm going to read a, a whole recent book of uh, poems uh, published by uh, Lunar Chandelier Collective called A Book of Infernos. 34 poems and a coda derived loosely from the cantos and circles of Dante's Inferno for the infernos and hungers of the worlds around us a book of infernos. Inferno one. In the middle of the journey, words began to change. My hand tore loose from yours, trying to turn the wheel, but growing numb. 
Inferno 2, daylight was going fast, the sky awash with stars like blood or sand, the company around us growing feckless, unable to find a place to rest. Inferno 3, God is pain and leaves us a broken door to crawl through, that the wind snaps shut, trapping the mind inside, unable to find a place to rest. Inferno 4, Limbo. Thunder overhead breaks hard. The more it sounds, the more they run from it. Poor prisoners inside a house of plundered dreams. Inferno 5, a light that drives them blind. They stay abandoned, thinking of the chances lost, of bodies raw and flailing in a muddy wind. Inferno 6, those who have gorged too much are hungry still, never too full to calm their craving. The more they eat, the more they need to go on eating. Inferno 7, the dirty lies stuck in their throats like rotted bread. What if they suck it down? What if the ground swells up under their feet to trap them? Inferno 8, time in a dark corner of the mind grows small and darker, the deeper image coming down to us, imagining a tower that might touch infinity. Inferno 9, the bodies stored in crates and torch, how they remind us of the fires burning down whole cities from which an angel rises, blinded in a gulf of tears. Inferno 10, after the body dies, the mind dies too. There is no present here or past, cracked open in a mindless sea where time reverses course and falters. Inferno 11, the air grows heavy, smutty, filled with black stains. The plan of hell comes true, more in the smell, the waters rising up, the little figures swelling, swept away. Inferno 12, the shattered rocks sow anger in the mouths of those whose houses have been torn from them, reaching out and driven back, where cruelty is met by outrage. Inferno 13, a forest without trees is still a forest, Silent voices and a wind embattled and despairing takes the measure of our days. The dead are lonely riders half awake, transfigured by a rage to go on living. In Deferno 14, the burning sand in Dante's dream calls up the names of God, cat, fat face, arm of dawn, the mouth, the tongue, the swallower of millions. Inferno 15, Love comes at a price for some, for others the rewards take place in daylight, the dark edge of the abyss as close as it will ever be. Inferno 16, before hell's mouth in dreams, the world becomes a pit for burning, turning from a crowd and knowing that the time to run grows short. Inferno 17, wind swollen priests and preachers sharing the broken world between them, and the clown child rising to the heights is love of gold, a foretaste of the time to come. Inferno 18, sugar oozing from the lips of those who lick the balls and mouth of one a step above, their pockets full of shekels, little men deprived of love or fear, subservient to a clown, or worse, an open hole heavy with swollen worms, a fort and iron colored wall. Inferno 19, a god of gold and silver satisfies them best, the cruelty the godly foist on us, a golden hand extended who exalts the president of desolation, his lackeys at his side, no mercy shown nor given, the faithful followers and pawns of God. Inferno 20, the diviners, a rush into the future leaves them sightless where the moon and sun have vanished, and everything returns to what the mind once feared, the time ahead eludes them in the looming dark. Inferno 21, a struggle between thieves, the prominence threatens to tear the house down. They probe each other's openings, the way the body ends, leaving dead friends behind, a world of no returns and little left to lose. Inferno 22, soldiers in retreat like dolphins, who leave the hapless friends behind, frogs in a ditch, their muzzles caked with mud, while through the sand at either edge an iron army enters, ready like hungry ghosts to scoop them up. 
Inferno 23, the truth dies in the words of those who feign belief, the space between real and unreal stuck in their throats until their tongues exude them and the world grows dark, hidden behind a lie where nothing is real. Inferno 24, in the coming snowfall, thieves are everywhere. The highest and the lowest seal a compact out of sight and mind, plunging headlong down the streets, seized by thieves half buried in the snow, the highest places first and foremost. Inferno 25. Snakes intertwining rise before our eyes, not in dreams, but as we name them, with what dread the mind can conjure. Black as peppercorns, the poison seeps into the words they speak, darkening our days. Inferno 26, those who are little men dance in a ring like children standing on a bridge, a ditch below them. No one is safe from harm and no one still speaks the truth out loud. They only whisper in their master's ear. The lights turn red and swallow them, letting the dead sounds leak out. Inferno 27, the man who takes a shot at others buries himself. One death succeeds another and the chiefs brought low. We watch them fall, ready to betray each other, where no one draws the line. The cockeyed boss looks down and sees his body sinking in a ditch below. Inferno 28, a house divided, the dead with bodies split in two. In a dream, we see their entrails hanging, spewing slime from tongue to rectum, dark winds rising, where the shit runs free. The cruel majority feeds on itself, ready to hide the sun. The near world changed to dross and screams of laughter. Inferno 29, the lights go out and fingers scrape the skin away that opens to a touch, a rush of voices bounded in a chip, the sound of heaven everywhere, now like a dead sound, the shadow of a shaman sowing discord, still hovers over all and knows no end. Inferno 30, Noise no longer beautiful pours forth from every corner, driving the father's mad. The stricken mother barking like a dog, an image out of Dante. Babes exposed to waves of cruelty, caged in the summer's sun. I am the god of pain, the god cries, eager to resume his throne. No more a god he is than I or you. Inferno 31, the towers rise like giants over the empty town. The fire is dying and our dreams blocking the sun. No friend there in the night, but only cries coming from the mouths oracular of those who cry. A siren louder than a heart deafens us thrice. Inferno 32, the field of stones under a lake of glass, a world betrayed and lost. The remnant of the war leaves streets of bones and rubble. Fallen walls close in, burying us in sleep. Absent all hope, the keepers of high words turning on each other who leave the dead to die. Where man, they like to tell us, is wolf to man. Inferno 33, a cruel clown gnawing the skulls of those who die from hunger. Images not soon forgotten games we all play with the forsaken young. The figures drowning hair and bone caught in the master's mouth. No one more in love with death and those above us, a broken tower, a swollen clown, throats choked with lies. Inferno 34, the stars in mindless space, a deeper image, testing the lie of God and time, opens the sky before us. Even our dreams are false, but beautiful. The picture Dante gives, a father who devoured his babes, can't be erased, not even by the stars that face their end like ours but never die. Coda. A man with three mouths once imagined sucks out the life from those he swallows. The privilege of the rich escaped and safe, the sky no longer beckoning, who hide behind each other, driving back the dark invaders. They are the final guides for this inferno, guarding what they build and plunder under a black sun that will lead us to another world, a gilded hell, the hungry earth, absent of dream, unable to call us home. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you, Jerome. It's hard to go on after that. Such a powerful, powerful conclusion. Let me introduce then Piazzo Ries, himself a master of giving. He has put into English the complete works of Paul Salah. He has given us German poets and French poets and Francophone poets of the Maghreb and the Near East. He worked with Rothenberg, of course, on those great anthologies, but his own work, owned in America in his teens, got to see some of that then, enriched later in, in his London years among the great Brits of the day, Juris has succeeded in creating a body of a body of poetic work faithful to his European sensibility and at the same time to our American ear. His poems and drama, essays and anthologies, he has lassoed so much of his world and made it ours. Please welcome Pierre Jouis. Thank you, Jer Jerome, and thank you, Robert, for this. Um, thank you also to Fong and Malvika and the rest of the crew at Brooklyn Ray that made it possible, and a big hug to all the friends in whose company I feel most honored to be reading today. Me in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and I also want to acknowledge that this is the land of the Kamasi Brooklyn tribe of the Lenape, part of the Delaware Nation. Uh, a few poems from earlier this year. Uh, April 6th. Everything looks normal from where I sit. Nothing is. April 14th. So what is there left except for the light of a watery sun slanting through clouds? Some cars, some runners, all wearing masks, except for those three in a circle. What is a circle of three? There is no way of squaring that one, except as the four line stanza come in without asking and now broken up. Based on six feet distance, who are smoking in concert and that five kid family of Orthodox Jews rushing towards the pier and maybe the water will part and they can escape the plagues of New York. No pharaoh will chase them to no paradise. April 16. So in the last dream, Derrida comes down the majestic red carpeted staircase just before day breaks and with a large smile and with an even more expansive wave of his left arm, the other rests on the baluster gives the order for the gerrymandering to begin or to end. I can't be sure how this one links to the long black and white dream just before, only a quick pee separates them, in which I talk lengthily to various politicians and a few pundits, me included it seems, about the evil of gerrymandering. And we're all absolutely certain, as certain as one can only be in a dream, that our lives depend on ending that terrifying trend. And now that I woke up for good, I would really like to go back into the last one and ask Jack if his gesture meant to begin or to end what the dream proposed. But I can't, I can't. The sun has risen behind me where I can't see it, but I do see its reflection in front of me, reddening the East Coast buildup west of here on Staten Island, just across the Barazano Straits. Much quieter today these waters not have as world as yesterday or as my dreams make me today. Uh, another earlier poem looking out over the Verrazano Straits uh, and at a map on my computer, shipping out at 1.25 p.m. 
on Herman Melville's, Melville's 200th birthday. Heaven's Gate is headed for Whitehall at 16.7 at knots. Atlantis is headed for New York Harbor at 8.4 knots. Owl's Head is headed to New York, New York at 22.8 knots. Atlantic Compass is headed for USNYC at 15.5 knots. Spirit of America is headed more or less towards Staten Island at 16.9 knots. Then again, is headed nowhere at 4.4 knots. <laughs> Anthem of the Sea heads towards Kings Wharf, Bermuda at zero knots. Jewel of the Harbor is hiding under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. Spirit of New Jersey is headed to Town Point Park at seven knots. Paradigm is heading somewhere at 8.3 knots, visible from my window. Henry Hudson is doing a harbor cruise at 4.2 knots. Alandra Corello and Nancy P rest near Constable Hook. Celestial is heading north at 5.5 knots. Memories Made lies at zero knots in Edgewater. Dana Alexa is headed for Bay Ridge Flats at 1.6 knots. B.W. Ryan is headed for NLRTM at 0.4 knots. Radiant Pride is headed nowhere at 0.0 knots. Destiny was traveling at 6.2 knots to an unknown destination 10 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, now a poem that kind of uh, could be also subtitled biting or at least at least nibbling at the hand that feeds you for Robert his caprices number 95 which has the priests say that's what purgatory is for to end the game and settle up the score I don't agree with the priests purgatory is not the end of the game in fact purgatory is all there is Heaven and hell have fallen away or never were, and we are where we always were and will be, smack in the middle, the in-between that is us in the world and the world in us, misnamed by said priests. It is what the poet Ibn Arabi called the Barzakh, this caprice on Easter Sunday, 2019, New Orleans. And something more recent, I think, here. The art of the fugue. No, not today. This morning it is l'art de la fugue, or how to run away from yourself, to come to yourself through an outside snow this morning that lives up to and beyond your vague ideas of another beyond, a behind, rather, as from the other side of this page, the ink bleeds through my contrafugue that goes into Das geht in die Fugen, an in between Das es kracht. My counter move and sound, mirror images, brings nothing home except right now what stops my storm. This metaphor that ink can bleed or can it? And from this one is from 17. In the dark days of summer, three of them. One, thinking in Europe begins, suggests Pascal Quignard, that is in Mourir de Pensee, with Argos, Odysseus, Odysseus's dog. See the Odyssey, chapter 17, line 301. Enosen. Odyssea Egus Eanta translates word by word as he thought Odysseus in him who came towards him. Two, which makes me think on lines by Habib Tongur I translated a dog's age ago and which read, Homer would say that nobody recognized him Ulysses except the old dog, but dogs don't live long enough to recognize their masters. Three, and riding the subway this morning, this, a baseball cap 
on the N train. In dog years, I'm dead. In red, on pink cap of a very alive Indian lady in her 30s. Uh, a poem for our close friend to painter Don, a Don Clemens, whom Nicole and I remembered just a couple of days ago on the third anniversary of her passing. A late antler for Don Clements. It may rise from the lowest left corner's edge. It may arch gracefully across space and does. It may come down again at the other end, heavy with accumulated matter, bone and pearl, but it never will disappear again. It is there in mid-air, it is ready and transforms into branch on tree. It now holds the bird, woodpecker or blue jay form you have moved into. Just beyond the double flame, one reel, the other reel too, a real image of you in Congress with matter, mater of us all. The antler, the antler, you gave me in celebration of birth is no hunter's death trophy, is your creation, a making not ex nihilo, but ex, but out of love. It is there, I'm with it, counting the pearls. And let me close with a tiny manifesto. The poet's job, pick up everything that shines. Discard the gold, keep the light. Thank you. That's lovely. Mm. Hello. I think we have to memorize Pierre's manifesto. Uh, speaking of keeping the light, I want to introduce Kimberly Lyons. In her generosity, she has worked hard and spread the joy of writing. Because that's what I feel when I read her work. There's a joy in writing through, through all kinds of ways. Her work with the Poetry Project, her work with the Luna Chandelier Press, but more than that, and always in her own work, deep, deeply died with the speculation about reality and what might be beyond reality. There's a sense of inquiry that poetry sometimes loses in our time, asking questions rather than giving answers. Her work is luminous with colors and precise details. Her work most recently shown in this chapbook online, Move, published online, which I think she's going to read from today, I certainly hope so. Welcome to Kimberly Lyons from Chicago. Thank you, Robert, Fong, Malvik, Nick and everyone at the rail for having me in your company today and yes indeed I'm going to read from Mauve um, which has uh, recently been published at metamvesum.org. Mauve, the afterglow on a movie screen, the flicker of black when afternoon is done, a shadow in the words Mauve and ambiguous, a lake of fog seen at 6 30 a.m. in September under an airplane wing. This dawn cloud is a violet bath, Ambiguous may qualify mauve, which is ambiguous already. Not black or brown or gray or purple. It starts to become something certain. Stop striving after whatness, I tell myself. Mauve in a certain mood darkens rain that falls more slowly for a moment. Time is ambiguous and you pass into winter one rainy Sunday night on a Friday late afternoon. A quality of sound is midnight and the dark is mauve before turning on the lamp, bathed in the brown sparkles of night. 
mauve, an old fashioned word, kind of French and department store, like outre and lingerie. Ambiguous and mauve are cousins to mauve and ambergris. These days, mauve is sandstone or eggplant, though really it isn't. Realize I'm there amidst overflowing shadows differentiated from twilight by the spreading blue circumference of a reverberation. The color of hydrangeas you see from the road on a stranger's lawn at dusk, remembered at 5.30 a.m., the most ambiguous time there is. There is a mauve chill over the trees, a slight blue around the edges. I turn off the lamp and see a halo, a tilting orb. Something wants to go on in the ambiguity of its substance and the shade that fills the glass, which truth to tell is green and yellow, a citrine kind of honey swimming pool. The unknown particle lifts its blue, a cluster of loose strife by the road. Blue darkened with blood mixed with night, compared to the nothing, mauve may be a net. I'll read the dust, leaves, sticks, and spider webs, dirt, and broken old plates. Over in the corner, the spiders continue to weave time into geometry and spit into string. I guess September healed me, but I don't know how. Lavender oil plums soaked in salt and valerian. An old woman crosses my path in an indigo cape. The wheels of her cart squeak all of the way out of sight. If I'm healed, it's along an ambiguous continuum. I realize that mauve contains all of night present in every moment that you look. A young man in a beret walks by in a mauve shirt past the loose strife. He is in a poem now. Poems take their animals from the sky. Kind of creepy, actually. But isn't poetry creepy like mushroom networks entangled underground? That's why I was glad to see the purple door up ahead in the air. Which part of yourself and how much will you give to what is up ahead in the air but already here? I hardly will spend five bucks on a pen. Five bucks, the best amount of money there is. You can buy an egg sandwich in a New York deli or chapstick or a candy bar or a pen, a mauve one with sparkles like the little girls use. The contours of afternoon pervade as a jumble. A bee comes looking into the glass, the cup of tea and shadows, busy with the search and glad to get some sugar. Well, who isn't? Now he lands on my hair and buzzes something in my ear and goes away. Go through the door, he probably said, or you weren't here yesterday, or I have a plan. So absent, I didn't notice the absence at first, sealed over. Something in me was eradicated one night. Since I don't go there every day, didn't notice. Anyway, the stars may emerge soon, at least in a children's book, if not here. Yet I'll look for them in the West when I go out to take the garbage where the empty high school is and the train tracks. A mauve car passes by, driven by a woman. I don't know what that signifies. Four doors on wheels. She's heading north. She looks tired. Hopefully there's a fountain ahead and small yet copious snacks. Start, stop hoping, the bee says at his busy distance, make it happen. Another mauve clad human goes by on a bicycle. She's oblivious to her designation. The flow of days are complex. It's hard to discern the details. Forget the details, says the buzz, but there is no bee, only air becoming variable. Oh, there it is, comes when called, and elaborates that it's the overall pattern that should be noticed. I must discount this bee's advice as three silver cars meet at the crossroads and stall in the glinting light and then go forward. I saw the low golden moon last night. I just remembered for a few seconds over the trash bins, some, some seconds still and some swift, most dissolve machine-like into the grinder as pellets if you let them, if you don't pay attention. If you do, that's a very different story as they say. Who are they? People of the August Augustinian age. I just read that today. Unsure when that was or where. It wasn't Augustinian everywhere, that's for sure. The bee has really gone away now, into the cool of afternoon, shuffling through dried grass and salamanders, inky, vinky, and boo. Blue comes in when clouds move away. But not blue, not really. One of those grays. There's an infinity of grays. Overnight, things turn to brown, clay-like. To my surprise, a red leaf falls down, whiny and with green. The angelic function of being offers the book. Then three people meet at the crossroads. She holds a cup of coffee, unmasked. They must have forgotten, forgotten what day it is in the month of Tishrei when you offer a goose to St. Michael and pray for help. Help, help me, help us, I say to the stars. The bee seems anxious. Who isn't? The sun slips south and speaks in the morning with a long golden tongue, laps the counter in last night's wine glass, licks what's left, and then withdraws into silence over the lake. Surely a bee knows all this is coming in, counts every second, in a bee way, which is infallible, not erratically like me, gulping time, looking for a match or a gizmo in the cloudy gloaming. 
I kind of wish John Keats were here. It'd be fun to talk to, have a cup of tea with, my not good enough for him. But still, he would joke and laugh, offer playful advice, the most polite person you'd ever meet, probably, deferential to uncertainty. Who would know a thing or two about time? Time to go, he says, gently uncrossing his trousered leg and putting his timepiece in a vest pocket. Won't you stay just a little longer, I asked, but he's gone. Only two dirty plastic green chairs and leaves relegated to the cobwebby corners and the sound of sirens. Yes, I am sure I was sick without knowing it, like so many. There goes my friend from seventh grade walking down the sidewalk. Now she's gone into the trees. Maybe healing brings back into view, into possibility, elements in abeyance. That's what being sick was, lack of access, frozen in the minute one labors to the next, as though climbing stairs in a shadowy hallway. Some cannot find that door on the left. All the particles rise from the ground, electrical with color. That's what I sensed before dreaming in poetry went away for six months. Now the guardian of the threshold drives by in a black truck, listens to the radio. He sees the V and I in his rear view. The little tree twists in this ambiguous, unseen, fitful, partial portion I'm allowed thinking is mauve in the evening. I hear someone say, perhaps the key is jammed in the lock. There's too much in there, too much indeed, and empty as well, as a well. Who has seen a well? I've only seen one. I see the word spark in gold on block, on black. Wait for it, though children cry in a house and then leaves wither greenly. A light over a doorway is compelling. Men on bicycles flit by. Crows are haunted crying like that. Tea is mauve also. I slowly remember memories or pods of purple, knotted rosettes, cups of chrysolite, writes the poet. The words are translucent like an x-ray. There is citron vert in the air today, which is wet, leafy, transmits, but with obfuscation and opacity. The bells sound dim, distanced. Gray, Sandra is a word in the French color dictionary, meaning mauve, but less involved, less intuitive and emotional. Mauve is made by water in the air. Where am I? Somewhere near, within. I'll recede at noon. Chrysolite cups sparkling on the periphery, that orb that comes into view all day. The future is a movie, a throat of lavender dust. Is the future even determined? Or what is the future? Really, I should ask, what is the present? A summation of possibilities, a bouquet of mums, blood tinted and ochre and orange, everything on fire. Love of the process, the alchemist said, no matter the outcome. Now the leaves are clacking and everything dims when the sun falls. There's the cloud, more movement and change, an acceleration of shadowiness and cool. I can feel what was green is black, crow's call, an emergence, a big, a big hunk of white cloud shaped like a huge skull. She shall be absolved, I think. I don't know why. Late quiet afternoon, dogs bark. Move windows seen through bright green trees disconcerts. Cool evening inside bright day now beckoning, alludes in a certain way to a dimension, sewn together spheres. I look through the window through the trees to another window. Blue dissolves and there's nothing there. No there over there, not now. Dark sinks in steadily. I'm the ambiguity. I fell asleep in some kind of way in the mauve ocean and woke up here in autumn in the rain, which today smells of cedar and something sour like that pomegranate juice in the fridge, blood red, sticky, a substance rarely used. Be careful with indigo, a voice said, to find a way through sharp amethyst facets of crystal through, six, through the six sides of the star. Every certainty dissolves in its fire. Is uncertainty the opposite that has flickered in and out of one invisible pool to another? Rain still falls from the polar region, a melt, an alchemy, a vapor that washes trees down, a level whirls imperceptibly, a violet wave stripped of garment, the rock of the particle, an intimation, such an old fashioned word used as rarely as pomegranate or mauve, thingless, yet not, or yet is, peripheral flashes, day one of the alchemical wedding. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. What an extraordinary invocation that is. It makes me want you to write about every color that there is until the whole rainbow is made the same the way you made that. And what's the sound? Oh, just start moving things around. Robert, um, do you mind? Perfect. Take it away. Am I here? Am I back? You're here. You might have to start over. We missed a few lines. Yes. I was going to say that, to my delight, to our delight, Billy Chernikov has returned to poetry and has gently, slowly revealed a body of work, <clears throat> body of work 
startling in its certainty. Her, she knows how to speak from what she is, as all of us gradually learn, but she knows that the body knows everything. The body is intricate, it's midst, intricate mysteries of touch and time. She celebrates, she holds them, she gives them to us. She's been, also been an editor of The Doris and of most recently of Salt and guided the Lunar Chandelier Collective for its, for its life, an offshoot of Lunar Chandelier. Um, but her work fascinates me, I think fasc will fascinate us by the quiet focus of every word, every line, each one building towards a physical enactment. The most recent collection is a book, little book called Amoretti. I don't know what she'll read from today, but I look forward to it. Very charnical. Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> and thank you, The Rail. Um, thanks to you all. It's an honor to be here among these poets and to read to you. I was wondering what to read today. Usually it would be the most recent work, but then I discovered that today is the uh, solemnity of the Immaculate Conception, the date on which the Virgin Mary was conceived. Uh, so I thought I would read these heresies. Our Lady, she is transparent like a chrysalis or someone in love. She comes early with a basket of roots. The work, any work, takes all day. Nevertheless, she finds time to clean, to polish the mirrors and fold the linens, sweep away the trespasses. At dusk, she sits and considers her own, unashamed as she was in the morning. This is her house after all, it seems, I thought she was the servant of. Floors gleaming, shutters shut. She is taking a nap like every man. The whole town, even the animals doze, chaste and fragrant saints in their dreams. She is reading the seventh chapter. She is the way, the way reading and breathing and turning the page are the way. Our Lady of the Belvedere is looking with love over town and country. She prays for us now and in the measureless nanosecond of our death, the haven, the almost chapel between breathing out and breathing in, the time it takes light to take one step. This next section in prose. The bathtub Madonna at the end of the street lifts her face to the morning sun palms held open in compassion, blue veil faded to palest blue. In afternoon shadow, her porcelain grotto reveals itself a scallop shell, overtly vulvic, and she, seaborn Aphrodite, willful libidinous, the lawn, the green sea of her birth, and I, a heretic pilgrim, adore her on my way to the point a convergence of waters, chaotic, even ecstatic in its resistances, while deep beneath the surface, the water sways and acquiesces as she does with her same graciousness that exalts the inevitable with surrender. And I am forgiven by her sorrow and by her rapture, her jouissance, and not only me, but all who pass by who feel guilty and don't know why, we prayers who don't know our prayers. Fontanelle, her yes moves through her, sways her, loses her, balance her book falls open, a drift of pollen. Her yes possesses in the midst of the crisis a no, an apartness she is and isn't, her instrument sextant or lute like anyone free to stay. 
Our Lady hails her life and yours, conveying to you her Shakti, her Juju, conceived of tenderness. Reanimate the word lovely for me, that I too may say how lovely she is in her confidence. When she bows, the alphabet hovers in the glory over her head, every letter at the ready. A Marian alphabet. A, as any girl can tell you, pomegranate seed grenade, apple of Grenada. What has she to do with Apollo, our Ava, a seed on her tongue? B, her belly, bees in the marigolds, be it done to me, holds every element in her house. Christ is only an open mind. Dia, open door, the delta, estuarine uterine. Every woman, her trident or vulva, a mermaid, combing her hair, Etruscan, Eritrean, earthling, lightning in her hair, her lyre, not far, never far, grail glyph, grotto, glade, girl bent over the book in her lap. Hi, Helios, sun, salutations, I greet, I praise, and receive him, I do. O oh, Jew, how you jaw, you mouth harp, jujube, apple that ripens into a date, sweet, lasts almost forever. K, an angel holding a lily, mirabili dictu, just like that. M, the center of a woman, the ohm of her womb, the image descending, a word come down in her pressing, her open and more. Mem, la mer, her waters break and nothing is as before. N, a tent, three sticks, a fire. She leans on a tree to labor. O, in itself an ode to Our Lady, a page of cups and newsy fish. How you go on, my darling. Question, a begetting utterance, water pouring from a jar. You, a jar overflowing with nothing, Q, the sound of blowing soft across the mouth of you. Our rapture, head on fire, remember her roving heart, her mirth, swan, her symbol, an order of solitude. I am alone so well in her presence, the well of her silence. Runic tea, the restless truth, agrees to be here among the trees. Undo, unknot, unravel, unfasten unto me. Open your eyes on the verge of paradise, virgin girl guide, mediatrix, the way, if you can bear her blaze. Welcome dreams of wolves in winter. Let us draw near to her blue fire together. Nexus, X, ineluctable crossing, catastrophe of love, my God, if only a kiss were enough. I don't know why, Yeshua, I feel scared and ashamed of this, us, myself. I raise my arms and cry out, not why, yes. Z, I zigzag, resurrect Isis, take refuge in zero, O oh, measureless lady, virgin plenum, where it begins. Acquiescence. Not as I guessed with my rude Latin of the nature of water, but from quiescere to rest, to rest from one's own willing and wanting, to offer oneself, to agree. Then what to make of her in the sky, bare-breasted, scarf around her hips, where her power quivers and shakes a leaping mahasita showing us the soles of her bare feet, her sex, the palms of her hands that beckon and bless and give this childish world a slap. Herself absolute, absolutely free, dancing over our Mariologies. All images come through her womb, chaste, promiscuous, motherly, bloodthirsty. She can turn herself into any symbol of her virginity green branch, new moon, red heifer renewing herself, a girl again, though she has known God and man and born a child 
and set the church on fire. A rosary. Lady, thy paradoxical virginity has the inconclusive beauty of an argument. My mind is not equal to it. My thought grows hectic as each proposition contradicts the rest. Sejura, tell me if that is your name or ampersand. Lady, in all enclosures I perceive thy chapel. Between my palms in a shadow, a number, a fact, a cove, a wave, a tomb, in a tercet of Dante, or in his crimson cap, in boat, or thurible, or in the month of December, in the secrecy of a book, or under the dome of the sky, accept my heresies as devotions. Lady, I confess, thy virginity and its proof astonish me. Broken emeralds mend themselves, I hear, when you make love like broken hearts or sinners spared and branches leaf in fire. Can you use me in your army or in your maiden choir? And this last one, Mary, on your birthday. Her flawless heart thrice pierced, a blood red emblem of her grief and ours, but closer a flaming heart-shaped flask of some perfume, iris, or myrrh, and closer yet, a rose itself, or at least the apparition of, that turns into the water that runs through your town, cool and green and full of shad, for just a few days in May, who spawn in the sweet water of the creek before they return to the salt. Mary, I dreamed you flowed right through me without resistance, continually, so that everything breathed the perpetu perpetual flower-like virginity of your yes. She is so human, someone says in my dream, this canticle of matter, a woman like any other. Yet just saying hi to her saves me sometimes, colors everything changes everything. Then something settled in us all, like sweetness in a fig, or faith in a monk, or friendship in a friend. Thank you. Thank you, Billy. Remarkable to hear about the Immaculate Conception and how it bred in your work two divine matrices, the mother goddess and the alphabet, the things we need so badly. So I guess it's time for me to introduce myself. Here I am, that's enough. I want to read just two pieces, one short, one long, quite recent. The first is East River Rhapsody. Riverbank, old sugar factory, where my father worked, shoveling sugar a century ago, the smell of it haunted him for years. And not a real river, is it? An arm of the sound, backbone of this island, slipped in from the sea. But what is real? They sent him to school, and me and you, they taught him German to help him find out what was real and what was not. Yes, German was the Spanish of those days. Taught me algebra, teach you, I pray, the rights of refugees and programming so we can lie in our beds beside some water or other and wonder why and why until we wake. The old sugar factory, the newfangled park along the shore. We learned all they taught us. Now what? Can we find a West River to take it all away? Oh, the city is the grandest thing we ever made. 
not so much the big buildings, but the million little red brown row houses, shoulder to shoulder, street after street. God, it looks like Beethoven when you see it from a plane. Then this next poem is called Sequitors, like non sequitur, but these are the other basic form. There are 11 sections, small. One, the taste of somewhere else lingers. Sleepy eyes, blue skies, the quiet rapture of the real. Two, light does this to you, whether you see it or not. Ocean of light, Apollinaire might have called it. We can swim with closed eyes. Three. All I mean is now. He died before I was born. So I am free to use his name. Ancestor, Wayshower, Sage. Ancestors indeed. It's up to me to make sense of all they said, all they did, and it's up to you. Four, call me up and tell me the truth. The Iliad is all about you. You have been standing on that wall 3,000 years, on the gate, waiting for someone to rise and sing, waiting for song to rise from the heart of the plains, the dogs eating the food down there. How can we let children read these things, the child in us? Call me soon and tell me the wait is up. Five. We ask the sun, please rise. Each footstep is a kind of prayer offered to the earth below. All we are is what lies between the secret channel of the world. Six. He nods his head as if he's counting the birds go by. A number is always an agreement, yes? He doesn't look at me. But I'm always there. Glad epistemology of ho hum, the always, the now. Seven. Is it time yet? Or has some other dimension? suddenly seized power, the way clouds rush in sometimes. Not today. If the sky is still blue, he reasons, there must be time. Friday on Earth, day of Venus, we're green and don't be late. Now the clock is set, eight. In those days, we climbed over the old dry stone walls, barely knee high, and found ourselves in someone's pasture, but no beasts in sight. Now this space is all for us. We meddle around to our legs content, always on the lookout for the maybe cow or horse or bull. We are city people, uneasy with things that move towards us on four legs. They call this the country, as if the city is some other nation, weird subways, unknown flags. Nine. So home again, to which all languages flow, all language flows. 
you can't be lonely if you have a language, even only one. You can't count without numbers too well, but you can bring peace and justice and even love to life in your head. Just say the word. Ten. Call that a prayer, a morning offering, a little Sabbath soul. I read. <clears throat> I read in her letter, birds go by like beads on my rosary. And I wonder what she says as each goes by, or what they say and what she hears inside. Eleven. The organization of innocence takes up a lot of childhood. Learn what to bite and what not. It is the same with music. Some intervals are dangerous to hear, but it takes years to understand which ones sustain and which ones hurt your poor little head a bit, or exalt it like Schaus's rising knives. And then out of the forest come marching the tunes, the tunes, but be careful. What you hear once is heard forever. Thank you and thank you, oh Brooklyn Rail, oh great bird of the island. Thank you, Fong and Malvika and Nick. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, poets, for reading. Bless you all. So much, uh, Robert, that was incredible. Um, bless you all as well. Uh, thank you so much, everyone, Kimberly, Billy, Jerome, and of course, Pierre. And of course, thank you, Robert, for bringing us all together today. It's truly uh, been a blessing. As always, we'll share the recording of today's reading on our event archives, so it will be available for you in just a day or two. And we do this every day here at The Rail, so please join us again tomorrow when we're joined by author and scientist Suzanne Simard with publisher and firecracker Victoria Wilson for a conversation on Simard's new book, Finding the Mother Tree, Discovering the Wisdom of the Forest, which came out just oh. earlier this year. Uh, that will be at 1 p.m. Eastern right here in the Zoom. Other than that, thank you all so much. Uh, and I'll invite you to turn on your microphones in case you'd like to say hello to one another or goodbye on your way out or anything else that comes to mind. But this has been, as Robert says, uh, truly a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Marisa. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Thank, thank you, Robert. Thank you, thank you, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Absolutely. Thank brilliant. you so much. Thank you, thank you, Robert. Thank you everyone. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
That's my always been my dream. So we're gonna work in toward toward this goal, and we'll keep you all um, update as soon as we achieve that goal in early next year. Oh. Yeah, and the meanwhile, oh, yeah. yeah, keep up the good work, and we need you all. Thank you, Paul. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Jerome. Good to see you all. Thank you, Kimberly. Thank you. Thank you, Pierre. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. See you tomorrow for Susan Simard, my yes. favorite book of the year. Do tuning when you can. Yes. Um, yeah. Much love and courage, and see you all soon. Take see care. Soon. Bye, fun. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone. Stay safe. Take care, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.